to begin the class session. First of all, subscribe to our channel. I what I want to say to the YouTube audience is to please subscribe and click or uh, whatever it is that you do on the like. Thumbs up so that we can get uh, more uh, exposure, hopefully. to the John Ray channel. <laughs> to click on thumbs up, I like. All right, let's start with our lesson. We're a little, running a little, a little late. And so we're going to do Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. Uh, this week, and then we're going to conclude uh, our study of the book of Hebrews uh, next week. Um, I'd like you to read with me. I hope you have your Bibles open at uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, remember what I have indicated to you before, my understanding of, of what this book is about. And who it's to is to all of these people that Jesus went around teaching. And let me, let me tell you that, uh, that, and this is the best illustration I know to, uh, to illustrate it, um, is that um, you all are, are familiar with Jesus feeding the 5,000 with a few loaves and a few fishes. And there was 5,000 people there on the hillside. But there was only 12 disciples. Well, the point is that there, even today, there's a whole bunch more people out there than there are disciples. And, uh, and, 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 and everybody that's a people, every, every people person that there is is not a disciple. They don't, they, they don't believe, they just, they just have continued on in the Father's traditions. And I'm talking about their earthly fathers, generation after generation after generation. And Jesus comes along and teaches something different than what they have heard before. So that's uh, my understanding of what uh, the book of Hebrews is about, and I think that it's evident in, uh, um, in chapters 9 and 10 that is our lesson for today. So follow with me, starting with verse 1 of chapter 9. It says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service, and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made. The first tabernacle, wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, that's called a sanctuary. But after the second veil, the tabernacle back there behind that second veil is called the holiest of all, otherwise known as the holy of holies. 
And it had a golden censer, verse 4. And the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. The Ark of the Covenant was overlaid round about with gold. And in that, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and it had Aaron's rod that budded, and it had the tables of the covenant. Now what, what Paul is doing here is he's, he's, he's going through the basis of men's traditions for worshiping God. And he's talking about this tabernacle and how it's laid out and the space here and the space there. And, and you, you're not allowed to go into that space. And I, I talked about this some last week, but, but we, we get into the scripture that really says it. I just, I just, I just described it. Verse 5 says, And over it, now the it is the Ark of the Covenant, which was overlaid round about with gold, and inside it it had a pot where they had saved some of the manna that God gave them to eat for 40 years. They were almost 40 years while they were wandering around in the wilderness. And Aaron, the first priest, had a rod. All it was was a stick, and it was not planted in the ground. It did not have any roots, but it budded. And they put that in the Ark of the Covenant. And over the Ark of the Covenant, verse 5, the cherubims of glory were shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, my understanding of uh, all he's saying there is we don't, we, don't, we don't really know much about why that's the way that was. And not much I can say about it is what I get from that. So moving on to verse 6, it says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests, went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. Now the first tabernacle is the one that's described in in, uh, in verse number 2. It had the candlestick and it had the table and it had the showbread. And that's the space in which the priests went to accomplish the service of God. But into the second, this is verse 7, into the second tabernacle went the high priest alone once every year. Not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now, um, we could change the word errors without doing any harm to the scripture and just call it sin uh, for the sins of the people. So, the point here is uh, is that the high priest went with blood. He went with a, a killed animal and offered the blood for himself first and then for the sins of the people. Verse 8 says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying by doing this, 
that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. It's saying we can't get into the holiest of all. It just isn't yet within our reach. Talking of Paul's time, it's within mine and your reach. Hallelujah. Not many. Uh, there's an awful lot of people in my observation that are uh, playing church, that are saying that they are Christians when they don't read the Word, they don't go to the Master's table, they don't do any of the, the things that are required to establish a relationship with God. But what verse 8 is saying is that that the Holy Ghost was testifying or signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Now the first tabernacle was the one with the table and the showbread and the candlestick and, and it's where the priests did their uh, services to God. Uh, but they couldn't go into that second area where God really was. Now, you and I have the privilege, the opportunity to go straight to Him. And what, uh, what Paul is doing here is he's going through the uh, routine of the traditions which the men knew very well in synagogues all over the places that Jesus walked where there were Jewish or Hebrew people. Verse 9 says that these items, meaning the, uh, the, the tabernacle, both the out, outer tabernacle and the inner one, they were a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So there, there's a verse right there that tells us that the law, that the law was not effective. It, it could not work. Uh, to our our benefit, but again, I tell you, uh, I stop to say that what he's doing is he's setting up this opportunity to uh, commune with these unbelieving Hebrews, the ones that haven't yet been converted to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He's, he's setting all that up in his conversation with them here and, and pointing out that, that uh, the blood, although it doesn't say blood in verse 9, but the blood that the priest took into the holiest of all couldn't accomplish what was accomplished by Jesus' blood. Okay? Verse 10 says, and it's referring back to uh, uh, the 
imperfections of men stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So he said, he, he's, he's basically saying that these um, uh, meats that you could eat and, uh, and you know, back originally, uh, God said you, you can't eat unclean animals. And uh, basically there's two things that uh, defined or separated clean from unclean. The clean ones had hooves and as a fish, they, the clean ones had scales. The unclean ones had toes instead of hooves. And as far as fish goes, they didn't have scales. It was the the slick skinned uh, sea creatures that you couldn't eat. And it was the creepy crawly things like crabs and the like um, that you couldn't that, that you couldn't eat. And he's just saying here that that it that, that 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 your traditions in the past were only I'm in verse ten they were only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances. But verse eleven Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. No, no way. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place. Now, he didn't really go into the holy place. He went to the cross. But Paul is making um, reference here to the cross by calling it the holy place. And at the end of verse 12 says, he had obtained eternal redemption <coughs> for old John. Hallelujah. And he's he's trying his heart. He's trying as hard as he can to get these un, un unbelieving Hebrews to understand what had happened when Jesus came. Verse thirteen says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean if that sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. So how much more shall the blood of Christ Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He's, again, I tell you, he's trying to persuade these guys that, 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 that don't really realize what has happened. Now, we've got a bunch of, of converted Jews, and when I say a bunch, we know that 3,000 was converted on the day of Pentecost. And um, in the next chapter of the book of Acts, I think maybe it's two chapters, but it says 5,000 were added. So I don't know if that 3,000 included or was in that five or whether it was 
uh, you add them together and you had 8,000. But those people were from out of town, most of them. And, and they, they scattered back from Springfield down here and, and, and went and covered the whole, not just this territory where Jesus walked, but they went up into Asia, up into places like Ephesus and Colossae and, and, and over in there where Paul went to minister to them. Uh, and they also came down this way to Cyrene uh, and uh, into Egypt. And they went uh, uh, further east uh, into what nowadays we'd call the Middle East. But back then, there was... Uh, there were Christians all over the place, but they just were in the minority, and they couldn't they couldn't make this argument that Paul was making. Well, Paul had the ability to write, and that's what he's doing here. He's he's writing to these people, trying to persuade them that the blood of bulls and of goats. And the ashes of the heifer, I'm in verse 13, sprinkling the unclean and to sanctify the purifying, purifying of the flesh. So how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Go back and look at verse 9. At the end of verse 9, start with the word that. It says that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And then we get down here to uh, verse 14. Hallelujah, we've got something that can purify the conscience. Now, let me tell you, it, it doesn't uh, uh, purify the memory. We still remember the, to use the word, kindly that the scripture uses, we still remember the errors that we made. But our conscience can be free of those. Verse 15 says, and for this cause, he, that's Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, he's getting set up here, and he mentions it way back here in, in chapter 9, uh, verse 15 that I just read. Uh, but he's setting up for next week's Sunday school lesson that uh, we, we're going to read the what's, what's referred to as the Hall of Faith uh, in, in chapter 11 uh, next week, and and he's he's talking about here <coughs> that Jesus became a mediator of this New Testament, I'm in verse 15, that by means of death, he died for us. For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now when we get to verse, or chapter 11, 
We're, we're going to read about a bunch of Old Testament saints and prophets. And, and Paul is already starting to, to think about that and how he's going to describe it. Verse 16, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Uh, basically, what and it, it is this is a, I'm, I'm going to reach over and, and pull a Catholic tradition over, over here, but but uh, people who uh, are priestly or cardinally or whatever, uh, even popefully, that they, they cannot be uh, saints until they're dead. And that's when, that's when, uh, that's when the people that are still alive are looking back and and that's uh, I know y'all will miss me when I go, yes. but I would like for you to uh, uh, to remember. Saint John. Yeah, Saint John. Yeah, yeah. Just just remember, and I will do the same for you. I, if you go before me, I will, I will remember the faithfulness that you had to the Sunday school class and the other things pertaining to God. Uh, yes, ma'am? We remember all the ones that were here that's passed on. Yeah. We were just talking about that earlier, you know, we, about all the people. It's gone on. We remember them and where they sit in here in class and how we would put their chairs in the right place for them when they would come and now they're not here with us. Yeah, what she's what she's referring to is with my uh, gimpy knee I sat over there on the stool and and Pointed and told her where to put and how to move the tables and to make sure there was enough space between here. And I said, that's because going back, we used to have some big boys yes. that came in here <laughs> and did. sat and they needed room. We had Ted Sky Eagle, we, yes. had, we had Brad Newby. Uh, and Jim Lee, uh, Jim Lee yes. he was he wasn't a little boy. Uh, so so I spaced out my, my tables to make space for people to be comfortable when they come here. That that that's what she's making reference to. I think that that we still remember those that have moved on. Hey John, don't you think that's a general like though verse sixteen is just generally about the you know, last will and testament. You know, when somebody would give their will, it's their last will and testament, so it's not in force until the person dies. Isn't that well, what you isn't it that you think that is? I mean you were talking something about the Catholics just saying the priests. I, I thought it was just for everyone in general. Well it is. I just was using that that Oh, as an uh, example. Okay. That is an example that they can't become priests. I'm sorry, they can't become saints mm. until mm. until they've, they've been dead a hundred years or something like that, and yet their memory lingers on, and and that's what I uh, uh, associate this with. But yeah, it applies to us Protest Protestant. Well, I, thought, I think it was just meant in general, like that, you know, when the last will and testament doesn't come into effect until the person dies. Yeah, yeah. all true. Yeah, okay. That's what that's what I took it. I didn't even think about any of those 
just being a saint or whether or not they're a saint. It's just the general, the will doesn't happen until a person dies, whether or not they're a saint, regardless. Okay. That's the way I took it. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I think about it longer than you do. Evidently. <laughs> so I think about other, uh, uh, other things. I, don't, I just don't read that into that. I, I'm not, I don't see it, you know, because he's, whatever. Well, that's okay. Matter. We can still be friends, Tom. Huh? Yeah, I don't, I don't see that in there. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not there. I'm just, not, I don't think that's the point he's trying to make. Well, I can tell you that my dad, dad wrote Will right beside there, Tom. So What's that? My dad wrote Will right by that. Yeah, so Will? Yeah. That's yeah. So that's, that's what my dad said, so that's what I <laughs> that's the last testimony he had. Yeah. <laughs> All right, verse 17. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. That, that's, that's pretty clear, I think, is that, uh, you know, we can have a reputation while we live, but uh, the testament that we make isn't um, sure and final until, until you pass. Uh, I'm going to have to speed up here. I'm going to run out of time. Verse 18, Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water, and scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book and all the people. Now, I, I just I want to point out to you that uh, that sprinkling is in the Bible. We, of course, in our denomination, believe in baptism by full immersion. Uh, and sometimes we make fun of uh, people who are baptized by that sort of thing. But uh, hyssop in that verse Hyssop is, is basically a weed. It's a paintbrush type thing that grows, and it'll grow anywhere, meaning it'll grow in the cracks between the sidewalks, or it'll grow in the cracks between the wall of the, uh, the, the west wall of the temple or, or wherever. So hyssop is what he used to dip into the blood and the water and sprinkle the book. And he sprinkled all the people saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, Moses sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there's no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with your hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for old John, St. John, and the rest of you 
as well. Us for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, 2,000 years ago was the end of the world. When Jesus came and entered into the Holy of Holies called a cross. It could be translated age. World. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. The once in the end of the age hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. I bet you've heard that verse before if you've been around church very long. It, uh, it oftentimes uh, is used and, and used out of, uh, out of context. Uh, it doesn't change the meaning of uh, of the reality of the fact that after we die we're going to be judged. It doesn't change that. But the point is it's, it's not used in the context of Paul describing all the things that Moses had done and had set up because God instructed him to as that became traditions of men. Okay, that's that's the um, uh, the context in which this verse is. And we're talking about uh, uh, whether blood has been offered for you or not, or whether you have accepted the blood that has been offered for you or not, and if. Uh, uh, if there's a problem there, you're going to face judgment without having had that blood applied to you. And that's the context in which uh, Paul has used this whole 26 verses prior to this 27th one. So verse 28, the last verse says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto, him, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hallelujah. Chapter 10. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. Now, last week, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the last two weeks, our friend Tom has been talking about shadows and types and so forth. And, and, and Paul uses that language here, and Tom was just quoting him. The law, verse 1, having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things, they're just shadows. It's not the real image. And they can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. And no matter how many times you come year after year and offer the sacrifice, it's not going to make you perfect. Uh, to me, this is a message to the unbelieving Hebrews, the ones who did not accept Jesus of Nazareth and his death. Verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? He's just saying, look, if they would have made him perfect, what's the use of keeping on doing it? 
Why do you keep doing it year after year? For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Huh. That once purging is Jesus hanging on the cross. Verse 3, But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So he's saying every year when the priest, high priest goes into the holiest of all places with the blood of a bull, you've got, you, you've got to remember the sins. And you can't clear your conscience. Verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. Now he's quoting Jesus here. Let's, let's leave out the parenthetical remark and just read before that and after that. Then said I, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. That, I think, is a reference to Jesus having prayed in the garden saying, Father, if it's possible for this cup to be taken from me, please do, but nevertheless, thy will be done. Verse 8, above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We usually add a word and in there. Once and for all. Verse 11, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering Oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. Now that oftentimes the same sacrifices, he's saying it's lamb after lamb after lamb after lamb, or goat after goat after goat, or, or bull after bull after bull, or ox after ox after ox, and none of them can take away sins. But this man, verse 12, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. 
I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. So the law is no longer written in stone. It is written inside you. All of you, any of you who want a true and lasting and meaningful relationship with the Almighty God, you will put his law into your heart. And the way you do that is you read his word. Verse 17, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having, therefore, brethren, Boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Now, all, all he's saying there is that uh, uh, that Jesus is the only sacrifice for sin. And if you sin after you have received Jesus, he'll, his, his grace will extend to you. Uh, uh, it, it just requires uh, repentance. Uh, uh, but the point here is that there is, there's nobody else you can turn to. It's not saying that if you've been saved and then you sin, you got no chance. It's not saying that. It's saying that there is nobody else but Jesus and his sacrifice that can purge your conscience from sin. Verse 27, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now that's, that, we could spend a long time about that, but if, if people disobeyed the law, uh, all they had to have was a couple of witnesses and, and that person would get stoned to death, hit in the head with big rocks. Verse 29. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace 
That, that verse is, is talk, talking about once you believe, once you've confessed, once you've repented, once you've turned, uh, once you've begun to serve him, uh, then if you trod him underfoot, there's no, 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 not really any help for you. Verse 30, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst ye were made a grazing or a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and ye took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring sacrifice. Now, these few verses he has shifted gears and he, he is talking to uh, Hebrews that that have become um, believers. Verse 35 uh, Cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward for ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. After ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. You will receive the promise after you've done the will of God. Uh, but there's a place where Paul wrote and said that he was, uh, he was the chiefest of all sinners and even after he had preached the gospel and done all of what he did, he had a fear of being cast away. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. I think 34 kind of, verse 34 kind of shows it's Paul too. Because he's talking about, you have compassion on me and my bonds. I, we, we all know that that was well recorded that you know, Paul was in prison and people giving to him, yeah. giving him things. I think it's kind of a little bit of proof that Paul wrote this. Yeah. I kind of yeah. see the last verses too, chapter 10, most of these verses is talking about people trampling on grace and not taking it seriously. So in other words, oh, you're saved by grace. It doesn't matter what you do. We can do whatever we want. And I think that's kind of what he's getting at. If we sin willfully, you know, in other yeah. words, you're, you're, your heart's not right. It's not a wise thing to do. Right. Yeah, you're, 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 your heart's not right. Your heart's not really in it. You're just using grace to kind of get away with doing whatever you want. But we have, this is, prevalent today too. So yeah. It's not very anything very, oh, yeah. very, very prevalent very today. Very People yeah. uh, oh, you know, homosexuality, whatever, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't and matter, you're do, saved do, by do grace. Anything, do anything for money. Yeah. You do anything you want. Yeah. You get away with it because you're saved by grace. And you can lie, cheat, steal, whatever. 
it's okay, you're, you're saved by grace, so it's all good. Yeah. I think that's what this this chapter, the end of this chapter, is kind of about. Yeah. No, it, it doesn't. That doesn't work. You, you went so sin willfully. You're not covered. Yeah. I think God's not going to be mocked. Very well put, sir. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments or criticisms or complaints? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just want to mention that at the, our Christmas dinner, we won't do gift exchange this year. So yeah, I don't think we did last year. We didn't last year, but I just wanted to. Oh, and I don't think you got that on the tape. You might put that on there. What is it, December 6th? Yeah. Did December. you want to put that on there? At what time no, is it? No, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't yeah. want to put that on there. Okay, you don't. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, we are indeed grateful and thankful to you for your goodness to us, for your mercy, for your blessings on us, for the provisions that you've made for us to come and be with you forever and ever. We've come to this place today to not only learn of you, but also to worship you. And we're going to worship you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who indeed is the Son of God. Amen. God bless you all for being in his house today.